Hi everyone, you're live on a Monday night, it's 9 o'clock, it's time for Use It or Lose It. On tonight's show, we're going to be reviewing the Super Rugby Week 5, the week that has just passed, with a focus on the South African teams, and in particular the Blue Bulls. What has happened to these guys? We want to be discussing uh, the future of manager Puerto Himan. Must he stay at the helm? Should he be given an ultimatum? Or should it be a case of him being shown the door sooner rather than later? Well, let me introduce you to the guests, but before I do that, if you are new to the channel, do go down below and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our videos. We, of course, have our flagship betting show, 9 o'clock every Thursday night, the Handicap Rugby Chat That Matters. But let's go straight to the guests now, and let's start with Andre. Andre, welcome back to the show, and first of all, congratulations. I believe that you've got something new behind you there on the wall, the degree. Yeah, I finally got it in the post. Um, a little bit of admin clerical issues, and finally... Uh, Got the little slippy to go and uplift it, so it's up on the wall now. Probably, the wife's not happy that it's in the bar, but that's where I want to. I want to put it up. Excellent. Well, we'll come back. We'll we come back to you. Plenty of rugby to talk about now, but well done on that one. And then yes. Jacques uh, from the yellowcap.com, he's down at the bottom there. Jacques, good to have you back on the show. Uh, you're working hard on 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 the Super Sport show today, I'm sure. Yeah, I know it was uh, another busy Monday. Um, getting everything, you know, for the reviews and s shows and stuff ready. So, yeah, another weekend gone, another not-so-successful weekend for the South African teams. But that's what we do, and we keep on carrying on. We keep on we keep on fighting. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, if I was looking at my Super Brew selections, I think the only South African team that I, well, well that I didn't fancy to win was the Sharks. <laughs> and they actually came out you, uh, and beat the Reds. I don't know why you guys didn't believe me. I mean, it was a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, my form is unbelievable. You know, I've got a, I've got a paid pool. We've all put five and a round, and there's 69 of us playing in the pool. Yeah. And I am, I think I'm coming 64th or 65th. You know, I mean, I'm basically gone after, after five weeks. It's actually, it's quite depressing <laughs> because I've still got to manage the pool and pay everyone out at the end. But anyway, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Jock, while I got you on the line, I'm sure you didn't stay up for it, but what a great performance by the Blitbox. 19-0 down against Fiji. Um, and coming back to win the game in, in extra time, what a performance. Yeah, yes, um, I watched the game last night, the quarterfinal. And um, um, I, I watched the match before that, New Zealand versus France. And after seeing the way the, the, the New Zealanders played um, and then the way that we played, um, against USA, uh, I, I, I don't. I, I must be honest. I didn't think we we're going to get past um, um, the semi-finals. And then when I woke up this morning, um, it was messages from all over coming. Uh, the blitz box one, the blitz box one, and I was like super chuffed. I mean, you know, it's it's like a, I think it's becoming a trend in my life where every weekend something, some somewhere I'm getting proven wrong, and that's what I love about sports so much. Is you know, it's like. You think you know something, and not that I not, not that I ever want the Blitzbox to lose, but um, you know I just didn't think they were that convincing against the USA. But cheapers, I mean, honestly, I talked to the guys for the. Yeah, I think just the fact that they can they with the team that they've got there. I mean, I think we can all agree it's it's not our strongest team. Strongest team. It's a very young team, and. Um, to show what they, they were capable of doing, it's just unbelievable, and it, it should be a it should be a lesson to to um, other teams around the world, and and more specific to teams in South Africa, that it just shows you how much confidence means first of all, and then also self belief. If you know you can do something, anything is possible. No, excellent. I mean, I have to agree with you. I don't think it's our strongest team necessarily, but it's great the way they're bringing the youngsters in. I mean, we're getting to the point now where we can rotate the squad and still be very competitive. Just a welcome to all the guys who are watching live on YouTube and also on Facebook. I've got a few interesting Facebook comments I'll bring up during the course of the show, but they were made earlier. Um, the Facebook video, you can, you can comment. Well, I think you can on the YouTube as well. A couple of guys made comments about our main talking point tonight, but we'll get on to that uh, a little bit later. Let's first talk to Andre about that performance. Andre, I mean... My son was telling me that against Ireland, Ireland kicked the ball out thinking the game was over and they'd beaten us. And then we got a line out and managed to score from there to draw the game. USA, we, we, we I mean, I didn't think we were bad, but we had to come from behind to beat the USA. Uh, I didn't see New Zealand, we beat them 17-0, but to come from 19-0 down against, against Fiji is incredible. Yeah, I think 
I think the one thing that the Blitzbox teach us, and I try and take out every time I watch them play and uh, see their results, they, they're the one team in South Africa that really keep their emotions in check as a, as a collective. You know, with um, social media and fans like getting really passionate and very emotional with wins and losses, we put a lot of noise into the system. And it, it tends to cloud, uh, cloud what, we, what we're viewing. And if you, if you sit down and you look at the process and look what Neil Powell has been doing over the years, um, it's, it's pretty similar to what uh, Jamie Joseph did with Japan. You know, he withdrew his star players. He, he wrapped them up. They worked together. Um, I think there's definitely something there that we can uh, look at in the future and how how teams like the Blitzbox and uh, Japan uh, bring a squad together and they, they're with each other for nine months of the year working and preparing for a tournament. Um, another thing that impresses me about the, the Blitzbox is the, the, the ability to recognize that what we're currently doing isn't good enough. We need to improve, and they will do it in the in the game. They'll make those decisions. They'll they'll say, "Okay, I'm not sharp. Um, I lost that battle. Stand up. Okay, take a deep breath, calm down. Okay, my next battle, I'm going to win it." And then they go from there. And th it's those little things that, when uh, when when the brand is flowing and we've got a couple of beers and we're watching with emotion, we tend to miss those little nuances that the that the pro, pro players have. And I I think a lot of teams. And the Bulls, for in particular, can maybe take a lesson out of what the Blitzbox have uh, put up for us in the last two, three years. Yeah, certainly they have, and they've been tremendously consistent. Every time I write them off, a bit like Jacques, uh, sometimes uh, you know wrote them off this weekend, they seem to come back and prove you wrong. I definitely wouldn't have had my money on them against New Zealand, mm. or I wouldn't have had my money on against them against Fiji. And I must tell you that I probably would have backed the USA to beat us in the quarters, because the USA, of course, have got a good record at home. Well, as far as sevens go, uh, sevens fans do note that the Vancouver sevens, I think, takes place this weekend. So we will have a seven show. We've got a, a few seven specialist punters that we'll have on. So look forward to talking that. But let's get on to the Super Rugby now. I'm going to review the game sort of in reverse because I want to spend most of the time talking about the South African teams. And uh, Andre, let me start with you. Uh, at Loftus, uh, we had the Hagiwaris beating the Bulls 39-24. Uh, so a 15-point beating there. They did go into the game as favorite, the visitors. But I was one of those guys who thought maybe this is the week where the Bulls are going to step up and, and, and you know, sort of prove us wrong and get the win. But they were never really in the match, were they? Yeah. You know, uh, on early Friday morning, I, I put out a tweet and I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm calling uh, all South African wins except the Bulls. And, yes, after the, the Lions went down and then the Storms went down, uh, that, that tweet really aged badly. So... If I had to look at the Bulls, you know, their performance, I took a lot of stick. I went to the the Superhero Sunday game at the beginning of the season. And of the four teams that played, to me, the Bulls didn't look the fittest. And I saw it, at, and, I, and I know you can't see much into a, a festival-type game, but you could see there already guys were walking on the field where the other teams just looked composed. The Sharks, the Stormers, they played their games. The players enjoyed it. They looked composed. The Bulls came. They played with a bit of huff and puff. But you could see that at certain stages, they were walking. And that's carried through into every single game. Um, this past weekend, you know, little things that I picked up. Our ball skills, our passing is atrocious. You know, like when you look at a hooker who passes without a no-look pass and the ball almost goes to the guy's feet and... Marco Fustanda has to pick it up on, off his ankles. You know, at that level, we sh they shouldn't even be worrying about passes like that. Those passes should be in the bread basket because every time a little pass is not is is inaccurate, it bites a little bit of time away. It gives the defense that little bit of chance to to close the gap on the player. Um, you know, if I have to look at the Bulls' situation as a whole. The, the first thing I would do is I'd have a, a, locker do, a locker room shutdown. Purchase a shitload of beer. For, for, sorry about the swear word. Buy a ton of beer, brandy, Cokes, lock everybody in the change room, and then just fight it out. Everybody sit down, what's wrong, talk it out, and nobody leave until the beer is finished. 
That way, then everybody, if there's something on their heart, something on their chest that they need to get off, they can get it off. But that, that would be the immediate solution into bringing the guys together just to try and get some clarity on what's going on. But on the, the bigger view of everything, the players need to start taking responsibility. You know, if I have to see Jandre Rudolph give away another stupid penalty, you know, it's it, the frustration when you're on attack and he comes in from the side or you're defending very well and then he sticks his hand in where it's not uh, doesn't belong. You know, after three games, you would have expected he would have learned that lesson. But that's just an example. In general, they need to take responsibility. They work off the ball, getting back into position, supporting each other, being in the right place at the right time, that kind of stuff. The next thing, and they need to support each other. And that comes from the president to the coach, from the coach to the players. So with this idea that I've been thinking about, it needs to be a two-pronged approach. For now, for the rest of the season, Puerta and the guys must be backed 100%. You guys, they need to know that on Monday they can come to practice. They've got the support of the committee and they've got the support of the players around them to do their job. But the second part is we need to look long-term now and getting rid of Puerta now is just going to create more unhappiness at this stage of the season. They should be... In the, in the news today, they were talking about they looking at bringing Jesse Creel back. They're look, talking about uh, Marcel Coutier, so I'm assuming he's coming off his contract with Ulster. So they, if those newspaper reports are, are to be believed, they, they're already looking at 2021 and saying, okay, this year it is what it is, but Puerto, you've got the full support. If there's something you need, we'll give it to you. Um, same for the players. But the second part is they need to get a coach that can strategically and tactically think on his feet, match to match, day by day, and in the game. So that's where I am at the moment with the Bulls when I look at it. The, uh, the option taking, the communication, all needs work. And that's, that's basics that should have been sorted out before the season started. Excellent. I can hear the passion in your voice there, Andre. I'm going to come in with Jacques now. And look, guys, I do want to discuss Puerta in a bit more uh, detail. I did headline the show uh, that we would talk about Puerta. And I've, I've got a Twitter poll that we ran there. And it's quite interesting. I can see, Andre, where you sit on this. Uh, but Jacques, yourself, the, that Bulls performance, I know you, you're a big fan, but it must have been a disappointing uh, poll to swallow. Or did you, did you expect the loss? I think um, last week when you guys asked for predictions, I said... Yeah, I know. I wasn't even keen to do a prediction because I didn't see anything good coming of it. And so, in a way, I think I did expect it. But as I also said, I'd, I'm always hoping for the Bulls to, to do well. And for the last four weeks, you know, I've been, or three weeks, first three games that they played, um, I really felt that they were in all of those games. And then I don't know what happened on Saturday. It was just not great. Um, I think Andre said a lot of stuff that I agree with at the moment. And um, for me at the moment, you know, I, I think the thing that really got me going, and you probably saw it yesterday, was, I mean, making an announcement about Dwayne Vermeulen coming to the Bulls at, after 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. I mean, what? I don't have a problem with Dwayne coming to the Bulls. Um, I mean, please come, but come now. Don't, don't tell me a story about something that's happening next year, you know, um, that's got no relevance to the current season. Um, all it's telling me is you, you're finding ways of distraction, um, you know, trying to divert um, what's going on at the moment, you know, diverting things from the team, diverting things from, from Puerta. I mean, Puerta is under immense pressure at the moment. And, and to be quite honest, um, fire, as Andre just said now, um, firing him is not the solution. Um, in all honesty, I don't think firing is... is is an option. Um, if anything, he, you know, he should rather leave um, at his own accord um, because at the end of the day, he is he is um, ultimately responsible for what the team does. But I also do agree with Andre in saying um, that, you know, the, the players and the team need to start taking responsibility. I saw again this weekend um, Mornay Stein getting frustrated. I mean, this is a guy that knows how to win Super Rugby. 
and he's playing in a team of amateurs and i'm saying it like this with all due respect i mean sorry i'm not i don't want to bash the bulls honestly i'm I've, i'm over that now and i'm trying to be positive but how does one be positive when things are going the way they are there seems to be no improvement we scored great tries this weekend yet we um allowed such you know um we, we allowed tries to come through easy easier than than whatever you know um it's just like it, there's something uh, every week we say there's something missing there's something missing i don't know um nobody knows what seems to be that not even the players not the coaches um one thing that i that I, i'm going to say and i know you said we need to start fight we, not start but the focus uh, we want to focus on um discussing Puerto Yiman and you know what's what's going on there and i think one of the things that i picked up is that i don't want to use the term body system but um it's because i don't think Quote is one of those guys that that that's in a body system anyway but i think he's got too much faith in old stuff in and he's not a coach that um can go over that hurdle of being progressive and uh, being modern um taking the game to new places like we see the other teams do you know being 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 adventurous if that is a word in rugby being more daring um trying things that that that's out of your comfort zone um he just comes over like a guy that i'm stuck in my ways and i'm stuck in my ways forever and I, you know it's just like there's a mental block and i'm sure i saw I, I saw um where did i i watched the post match present um press conference with quarter and i can i don't know if, if any of you two saw it but it, it. i saw for the first time quarter actually admitting that you know maybe it's time that i start doing things will will he do it i don't know i find it hard to believe that he that he's got the that he's got the balls to do it sorry for you know for putting it that way but um, I think it's time to be a bit to be a bit frank about about what's going on at the Bulls. Um, I want to just jump to the to the Lions, not not to their game, but we're sitting. I've got a lot of Lions friends, and you know I've got so many messages today saying, "Oh, it's what's going on with her team," and then all of them end the message, you know, end off saying, "But oh, don't worry, our team is. It looks like your team and our team, um, you know, we're fighting for the wooden spoon." And I'm like, guys, honestly the way you guys are playing is far better than what we are playing at the moment at least you guys look like you want to go somewhere at least you guys look hungry you know um there, there's a big difference between the lions and the bulls at this stage of the game and even though we somehow in in the same spot you know um or place at in our in our in our in in the existence of the unions you know both young teams uh, and stuff like that but yet they look at least they look like they want to do something and yeah i mean i'm actually running out of words but there's so much that we can talk about maybe andre must take a, take over a little bit well let me bring up the i'll just bring up the poll again so let's just put on twitter so the one option was sacked immediately 38 percent given an ultimatum in other words listen you've got four more games or whatever and you've got to get it right and then there was the 25 percent given the full board's backing which i guess is where Andre was coming from, and I think what you say now as well, although I think both of you also saying, give him the backing now, but he may not be the answer for the future, but probably sacking him is not... Um, on, on Brent's question, I mean, uh, so the guys have left, uh, uh, lost signal or something, so I'll just carry on the conversation. Um, I think it's fair to say that they need to back that they need to back with uh, but um a question that i do have and i see brent um and andres yeah, sorry. Us again so, but the question i've got is um i heard this weekend sorry brent to interrupt i no 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 i was cut off it's one. my it's my wife thanks for picking it up my wife is yeah, yeah. The moment. anyway so um something i um something i heard this weekend i can't remember right now where it was but um oh it was something that i saw on facebook a video chat as well where i heard that someone like Swiss the Brain is currently coaching Help Macar. Um, are you aware of that? Because I think you you in those circles. And I mean, I find that shocking to think that a, a guy like Swiss the Brain, um, for whatever reason, is coaching a school team. Hans Kuman, former Lions coach, um, is I think, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in, in the Cape. 
He's been paid a million bucks by a school. Why are we sitting with, um, and again, please, I'm not bashing Puerto here, but we need to ask questions and we need to look for solutions at the same time. All I'm saying is, why are these guys at schools at the moment when they could be actually contributing towards, um, you know, to, towards the Bulls or whoever? I mean, they, someone the Bulls fans have been crying out for, Jimmy Stonehouse. Whatever the problems are, they need to, like Andre said, lock yourself in a room, sort out your problems, and let's get on with the game. There's a, there's a team with a, with a deep history, a, a very well, um, one of the best teams in South Africa, and they are busy going, sorry for my language, to shits. Sorry. I'm going to have to put a PG rating on tonight's show, Brent. <laughs> well, don't worry. Our betting shows normally have a rating on anyway. But just to, sorry, the Wi-Fi, as you can see, is still giving me problems. But you know, just to come in, I'll tell you where my issue is with poor team. And I really felt he was the wrong appointment from the start. I was quite outspoken about it at the time. I agree exactly what you, you sort of say in terms of being stuck in his ways and he doesn't really look like he can change. And that's why the whole appointment of poor team struck me as very strange when it happened. Because you know, I've looked, I remember Puerto, he, he was a player. I liked him as a, eight, I think he was eighth man at, at Free State, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. He then coached, I think he coached Griquas at some stage. I can't recall. Uh, and then he came to the bull. He took his, he was there at Tux as well. And to me, he never really, he, he never really impressed me. He never really put his hand up at that stage to say, I, I should be coaching a big union by the bull. So for me, that was a surprise. So I was sort of of the opinion that, you know, it might be worth doing something a bit uh, quicker. Of course, there's also no point in sacking the guy if you don't have a, a replacement sort of lined up. I mean, that's also good. And I think rugby is very different to English football. English football, um, I think it's safe to say he'd be getting the, the board's full support this week and he'll be getting sacked next week because that's how it works in the EPL. Rugby is different. But I think the point being that it, it does seem we all seem to agree that probably he's not the, the, the long-term answer to the problem. And just a couple of the boys on Facebook uh, did, did say that, you know, they, they, they'd be quite happy for him to move on now. But Andre, any further comments on, on this from your side? Yeah. You know, like, Puerta did have an opportunity to be head coach at the Bulls. Um, and then there was Nolas Marais, and then we brought in um, John Mitchell. And it was when John Mitchell left, that, and and then at the same time, that that Zander Janssen van Rensburg issue with the contracting and stuff. So there was a whole bunch of behind-the-scenes administrative issue regarding the recruitment of players and appointment of coaches. It really hasn't helped uh, keep the ship steady. And I think Puerta at, at that stage it was probably had been in the system the longest uh, of all the current coaches. And, you know, the, they, get, they gave him the opportunity to, to take over. And w when I look at the stuff that he wants to do and he wants to achieve, um, and, and if you look at where he's come from, and he had reasonable success at the at the lower levels, um, I kind of see Port Eman almost like the South African version of the Stuart Lancaster. He, the, he he he's done. He, he's got the ability and he's got the the knowledge to work with youngsters and to to mould players into good players. He doesn't. I don't think he he hasn't got the knowledge and the ability to lead a team at at the highest level. And I think that we must need to be able to differentiate between the two. As as an individual coach, maybe working on key aspects, maybe as a forwards coach, mm. I, th I think that's where his niche would actually be. But he was kind of he was the unlucky one in the Bulls Union that got landed with the, that landed the job when John Mitchell left. So I think for us to be extremely harsh, and we must be, because he accepted the job. Same with Alistair Kutia. Alistair Kutia took the job. You've got to you've got to take the responsibility that comes with it. And I think, and, and I think at this moment in time, he, he, as unlucky as he was, was the one to get it. You know, it's an, it's a dream job to for any coach to take a franchise side. You need to know when you've bitten off more than you can chew, and. If the board say, Puerta, you've got it until the end of the season, you give it guns now. We want you to bring through the youngsters, give them as much game time as possible. The seniors we brought in, they're on your, they're on your bench. Do a bit of a uh, money ball effect there, you know, where the, the, the manager tells the coach who he will play. 
um, I think then that's that's what we the, that's what the, the Bulls literally need to do. And in between now and the end of the season, they really need to go and get uh, a coach. You know, somebody mentioned to me that you know Dion Davids could have still been part of the Springbok setup, but he probably would have been a great coach to take over at the Bulls. And I know a lot of people have got opinions about that, but when you can do when you can play a, an exciting competitive brand of rugby with nothing. I think you they, you've uh, you deserve a chance with a union that's got plenty of money, plenty of quality players, or or I use that word loosely. But if you've got players and you've got equipment, you've got a state of the art gym, and you've got the backing of the board, I would have loved to have seen what Dion Davis could have done at the at the Bulls. But it is what it is. So they are going to have to maybe go down a different option, a different route. Right, uh, Jock, anything else to add? Anybody you would have lined up for that job before we move on to the Stormers game? Yeah, I think I just want to I just want to end off this part by just saying one or two things. Firstly, I want to just mention, and I think Andre started touching on it. We've got the players, there's no doubt. I think the players in this team, um, if you look at Roscoe, Cornell, Morna, you can you know you can go through the team. We've got the players to do the business, but they need someone that can convince them or take them to that place where they can do it. Um, I just want to also mention that Quirta Iman was actually the forwards coach of the 2007 Bulls team that won Super Rugby. So if I look at all these things, and I hear what Andre just said now, and I agree 100% with him there, um, it pretty much boils down to me that Quibus, oh, Quibus. Um, Quinta is probably a great assistant coach, forwards coach, come whatever, but I don't think he's a he's a head coach. Unfortunately, that's that's the way the cookie's crumbling for me. Who to replace him with? Yes, I mean, I think I was one of the guys that was like, there's no chance in hell that Leon Davids is coming to the Bulls. I mean, you know what? Things have been said. Water under the bridge, everything's gone. We we all we all we regulate and think what we want to think. He has achieved a lot, like Andre just said, with nothing. So in saying that the Bulls actually have the goods to do something, they just need someone that knows how to do to do it. Maybe he did deserve a shot. Maybe Rossi, I don't know, but I don't think they're gonna fire Quota. So are they gonna stick with him till the end of the season? I actually Heard a rumor today that he might, um, not might, that he's leaving in August. Um, so please don't quote me on that. I just heard it from someone else. I don't know what the point of August, because that also doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But I think the Bulls have the goods. They just need to now start finding out how to use it. When, when they can do that, then maybe we'll start seeing something. But at, at this stage of the game, you know what, I think um, I'll obviously support my team, but I'm not going to put uh, too much hope into getting much further up the log than what we are at the moment. Excellent. Just a reminder, you can visit Jock's website, uh, theyellowcap.com, and uh, Andre's blog, myrugbyposts.com. And Andre, let's start with you then and move on to uh, the question of what on earth happened to the Stormers. They played against the Blues. They were fairly firm favourites with the bookmakers, sort of eight, nine point favourites. But the Blues started off quickly. They they broke down that Stormers defence quicker than anybody else has been able to do, certainly at, at at Newlands. And in the end, they were just, you know, they were untroubled. The, 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 you know, you expected the Stormers to come back in that second half and they, the Blues played, played a pretty clever game and, and won convincingly in the end. And uh, is, this, is this a sign that the Stormers are not all they cracked up to be or do we write this off as just a bad game? Uh, Stormers won the game in the change room before they went out. Yeah, they thought they had a one, eh? Yeah, uh, but you know, I was just uh, checking some of the, the 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 information from the weekend's games, and they they came out extremely slow. Um, and and if you come out extremely slow, you're going to shift two to three tries in twenty minutes, and that happened in three games this weekend: the Highlands Rebels three tries in twenty one minutes. Tars Lions, three tries in 17 minutes. And the Stormers is no different. Two tries and uh, with conversions in 21 minutes. So you're, in the first quarter of the game, you're already 14 points behind. You're chasing the game already. And um, 
I think, you know, if we have to just look at it superficially, yeah, I'd, I'd say this is one of those timely losses to remind you that you're not invincible. Um, but when you when you when you go a little bit deeper, you notice 37 missed tackles, 73% um, line out. Uh, they only had 37% possession, 33% of the territory. They were. This is what this game. They were on paper. Uh, when you look at the statistics afterwards, they were totally outplayed. Um, and you know, to uh, rub some salt into the wound, they've also lost uh, Peter Steptoy now for two months. That's three of their star World Cup players um, that they've lost. Now, I'm not. I'm not trying to predict a doom and gloom for them because I think they've got a better squad. But if you look at the Bulls. The Bulls don't, they didn't lose any Springboks because the Springboks left before the season started. So they haven't even had injuries to key players. Um, it's something that I haven't brought up yet. Is Sorry, I'm jumping back, but the Bulls, out of all the squads, don't have first choice Springboks in their, in their setup. They might have one or two old Springboks or some one or two players that have got a cap here or there. But compare that to the Sharks. And the Stormers, they littered with starting World Cup Springboks. And those and, and those players have come into the season playing good rugby, making good decisions on the field, tac good tactical decisions. And in this game, the Stormers players, they got it wrong. And I think I think with John Dobson and their current setup, they will be able to sort it out going into the the the, 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 the coming weeks. They've got a buy this week, so they will go home, lick their wounds. And then they're going to have a massive game against the Sharks in two weeks' time. Yeah, that's going to be an absolute monster potential conference decider, certainly. Uh, Jacques, your, your opinion on the Stormers there? I mean, uh, I, 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 my concern on the Stormers, I must just tell you that they don't, you know, they don't look like scoring enough, but their defence is always held up so true. But then you get these New Zealand sides that, uh, and I know they, they, they convincingly beat the Hurricanes early on in the competition, but I recall a few years ago, they had a very strong defense, and they went into, I think it was like a quarterfinal against the Chiefs, and they got torn apart. And that seems to be the danger with the Stormers, that when, when, when they do get unpicked, they, they're not capable then of scoring the points them, themselves. That's what happened there. What did you make of the performance? Well, I think under summed it up when he said they lost the game in the change room. Because, I mean, that you could see in the first few minutes that the Blues were up for this game. And... Um, I shouldn't really say surprisingly. I think uh, that was one of the reasons why I kind of thought the Bulls could have done it against them was because of the weather. And I mean, the weather was just perfect for for a running game. And I think the Bull, the Blues are uh, more of a running kind of team than what they are in a wet weather kind of setup. And um, they used every opportunity perfectly. And um, the thing that concerned me was also like I thought, Okay, now, you know, maybe the Stormers will come back in the second half. The the Blues will tire out. I mean, it was a hot day in Cape Town. You could see it. And, I mean, the commentators were pretty much on it throughout the game, you know, that it was quite a, um, a warm day. So, um, I, I thought that the, the, the Blues would fade away. And for some or other reason, they, they just maintained whatever they were doing. And they did it well. And But also, the Stormers... I mean, they had four great games where they were almost at, an, uh, you know, where they scored or conceded zero points in, in four games. I mean, the Jags got that lucky try, you know, uh, the soft try. I think Andre even said it in, the, in those words last week. Um, if it wasn't for that, they, they would have had four games in a row. Or oh, no, no, I'm lying. Sorry, the, the Lions did score against them. Sorry. But I mean, they, they, were, they just looked untouchable. And on Saturday, there was nothing of that. Um, the fact that you mentioned the, you know, the defences and stuff. Yes, I mean, at the end of the day, it's great. You can have as much defence as you want, but defence doesn't score you points. And um, on Sat I must say on Saturday, if I, if I go back to um, a week before when they played the Jags, and you, you look, which wasn't that convincing either, actually. I mean, they, they, they struggled to get... I think they only scored two tries in that match. Seven, I, I think it was 17-7. Seven. Seven. Seven, seven, yeah, and it was only like two that, tries. Yeah. So, yeah. where the weeks, you know, before, apart from the Bulls, which they also struggled a little bit, because, I mean, it was only 13-0. It wasn't a runaway game. 
But other than that, the Hurricanes, they, they blew away. They, they scored tries out of, you know, from everywhere. But on Saturday, they just didn't look like they had anything there. I don't know, maybe the, maybe the first four weeks has just been too great and, you know, it's become a bit of a, yeah, you know, run of the mill kind of thing. And, and they got caught out on the day by a better team that was in the mood to, you know, to play some rugby in, in good weather. Um, but yeah, I think I mean, uh, they've got to buy at the right time. And, you know, we, I, th I think the, like teams having buys in the second week, it just, it just buggers up everything. Um, mm. where this is, I think this is a, a better, you know, this is, the, this is going to be their sixth week. And now they've got a buy. So it's the ideal time to regather, just, you know, just get away from the game. I saw Jamie Roberts had a sing-along, you know, at the Grand on the, um, yesterday. So he's clearly enjoying life in Cape Town. And, I mean, clearly the guys are, you know, the guys are getting away from the game. So, you know, it's good. You know, they need to clear their heads and then get back to the drawing board and say, you know, where do we go from here? Because the next game, as you guys both mentioned now, the Sharks, it's going to be a hell of a big game. Uh, I'm not sure where is that game being played in Durban. 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 In Durban. In Durban. Well, that game in the last few years has been quite tight. So, um, but the way this season has been going, and these two these two teams are setting the trend at the moment, it's going to be like I think Brent you just said it's going to be a it's going to be a cracker. Yeah, gotcha. that will that will be a belter. Let's hope conditions are good in Durban as well. But certainly expect oh, yeah. a, a tight one. Now, I see Andrew just made the comment there. Willems is struggling. We did touch on that quite a bit last week. I, I, I was, you know, we, we sort of, I think, had the general call of let's give him a run last week and that. But he does really seem to be battling. And, and the problem with that now is I think his confidence has been affected. And, yeah. you know, that could push him back a bit. And even then when you may be moving back to 15, you know, he might his confidence may have taken such a knock. So I think the Stormers are walking a bit of a tightrope with him there. But they uh, yeah, I, I guess at the end of the day, they keep on going. I tend to agree with you guys that the buy is coming at the right time. Any, anything else, guys, on the Stormers before we move on to the, the one South African success of the weekend? Yeah, um, yeah. with Damien, Damien Willems, uh, you've also got to look. He's got Trocki at eight, Ursula Yankees at nine, and those guys, haven't, they've got a season of Super Rugby underneath them. They're also actually still pretty new on the block. Even though Herschel has played in the World Cup and he's played in the World Cup final, um, and then he's got Jamie Roberts, who's very experienced out of him. So if you, you take that axis of 8, 9, 10, 12, they're, they're still trying to find each other. And the, the, the experience isn't uh, three, four seasons uh, of players are uh, working together. So I think maybe may, I'm, I'm just speculating. Some of the pressure on Willems is that is the inexperience of that those three players working together as a collective. Yeah, that's a good point. Anything else from you, Jacques, before we talk Sharks? No, no, no. No, I did bring up the question again um, to the latter st stages of the game on Saturday on Twitter. Um, and I'm, I think I'm going to be trying... I want to watch this. I want to watch this develop. And I, I really do hope for, for his sake that, you know, he can come good because I, I must say, deep down, I am a Willemse fan. And it, I think he, if he has to hit form... Um, we haven't seen a fly off like him in South Africa for a very long time. I actually don't know who, to, who we would compare him to. But, um, yeah, let's just see what they're going to do and how they're going to get around it. Because I hear you guys saying let's shift him back to 15. But at the cost of, of Dylan Lates, you know, what has Dylan done wrong? Not that Dylan's been overly explosive as well. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. And then, obviously, who will take over at 10. But anyway, let's wait and see what they do. We'll wait and see what happens there. Well, there was some good news for South Africa on the weekend. It wasn't necessarily good news for me as I made the Reds my best bet of the weekend against the Sharks. It was a tight game early on. The Sharks started taking control in the second half. And really, they've got... I mean, I think the Sharks would would thrive playing at a place like Loftus or Ellis Park or, you know, with the, with the conditions for their backline because they've just got such an exciting backline. But they beat the Reds by 10 points, 33-23. And that's three wins out of four on tour now. And... When you look at the log, yeah, they, you know, people might be tempted to still call the Stormers a favourite for the conference, but to go overseas, Andre, and win three out of four, <laughs> that, that's a brilliant performance. Yeah, that, you know, I've actually got that here on the notes here that in the game, they were, 
it was about the 79th minute and they or the 81st minute and they got a penalty and they decided to go for the bonus point. The game went on for another nine minutes. Mm. And they ended up getting a yellow card. Uh, uh, um, Volvo, I think he got the yellow card in the 86th minute. And then the Reds ended up scoring a try in the 89th minute. And, you know, when you've got 12 points on two or three, three wins from four um, games, there's absolutely no need to, to push uh, for the bonus point win. Uh, that extra nine minutes, plus they've got to fly back now. Now they've got a big game against the Jags this weekend. Yeah. Um, that was, for me, that was, out of all the good that they did, that last 10 minutes could have undone the all the good work that they'd done on tour. Um, but in general, I'm not a Sharks fan, just like as in a general... Um, but I can really get behind the way they've set up this season. The, you know, where we talk about the Bulls making poor decisions, poor passes with the Sharks, they, they taking, they, they're making the right decisions. The passes are good. Their reads on defense are, 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 are great. And I think from here on out, they just need to keep tweaking a little bit, a little bit each week by each week, getting a little bit better. Okay, this is what we didn't get right today. Let's let's work on it. Let's get that perfect. And slowly, I think this team's really going to do well this year. But I, I, I do think in if they keep this core group together for two to three years, I think they, they can really be pushing for to be one of the top three teams over the next four years. Um, those the, the players that they've got now are just they just look like they are solid at the moment. Um, M is really pushing for an early shot for SA Player of the Year. He's playing some great rugby. Notcher is our, our form number eight. I think he's still um, he's still got some work to do when it uh, if we want to start considering him for Test rugby. I think he is ready, but he's not going to give you fifty Test caps decision making. Uh, but I, I think against Scotland and Georgia, he can play the f full three games for us at eight and get some great. Uh, Great test uh, test match rugby under him there. Another player that we've spoken a lot a, a, about a lot is Fussy. This game he was very quiet. Um, if he wants to be in that Springbok squad permanently, he's going to. He can't have quiet games. Every week's got to be a big game. And then I know <laughs> Louis Schroeder is extremely un uh, underrated, but I think he's actually his experience. Um, is what's lacking at the Stormers and what's lacking at the Bulls. You, he, he's making South Africa plays with good tactical nines, and at the moment now he's the best tactical nine we've got in the country. I'm not saying he's our Springbok nine. I'm saying he, he's complementing the way the Sharks are, uh, are playing and he, his leadership. And I think not being captain this year has freed him up to play his game, but he gets to make good decisions on the field, make decisions that's good for the team. And you can see it coming through in the way they play. Well, Jacques, I'll bring you in there, but just a quick story from our side. I know quite a few punters who won unders points there in Brisbane. And uh, it looked like they were going to win. I think under 51 and a half was the line, only to have their heart broken in the sort of 87th minute. So there's always a betting angle in it as well. Even though the game was won by that point, uh, there were still people uh, who had something to lose or something to win on the match. But uh, any, anything else from your side to, to add on the, on the Sharks before we, we go on to the Lions, Jacques? Well, I mean, Andre said it all. I just want to say, I mean, I, I started watching that game just before halftime, and I was appalled at, at the referee. And, uh, I mean, I know we shouldn't probably be bashing referees, and I'm not going to bash the referee, but the standard of that guy, Brendan Pickerel, was shocking, to say the least. Um, that I think you can blame him for your under-51 bet that you lost, because <laughs> honestly... I remember even seeing someone tweet that this guy was just looking for anything to make a, a penalty of. I mean, honestly, that game should never have reached, what was it, 88 minutes or something. It was like this guy was, he probably knew about your bet. It, you know, it's, uh, it's, it, it's <laughs> yeah. the only thing that makes sense. But I think, um, again, like I think Andre just said now, I mean, it's probably for a bull supporter to support the Sharks is... It's like, yeah, that gebeur nie. And um, 
I must say, I'm enjoying the shot rugby at the moment. Bloody <coughs> hell. I mean, that is proper rugby being played at the moment. You cannot but, you know, appreciate it. it, it it's, it's really, it's good, good rugby. And I think most people around the world would agree with it. Um, Noche is, yeah, again, you know, he's, he, that break he made, that was just unbelievable. Um, you know, and I think the guys at the Stormers must be thinking, well, you know, if you had played this way, um, you know, we wouldn't have let you go. But, you know, it's, maybe that's what he needed. He just needed a breath of fresh air. And, you know, he's enjoying himself now at the rugby. I saw some post-match interviews with him where, you know, he was just saying, and they, they, they actually asked him, you know, what, what uh, how come the players are so happy and stuff. And he just said, you know, it's just, they've just been embracing everything. They do everything together. Even if they're going to have a cup of coffee, you know, everybody's almost there. You know, they just want to be part of each other the whole time. And it obviously says that the vibe in that team is unbelievable, you know, um, and that's the way it should be. I mean, it's like I said in the beginning about the sevens, you know, it's it's all about confidence and self-belief. And if, you, if you're a happy team, you've got both of those things going for you. So I'd, it's going to be interesting now to see with the Sharks coming home, um, if they can continue that, because... Um, one thing that that I've noticed is, for some weird reason, they struggle to play at home because of the humidity and stuff. At least the seasons are changing now, so I don't know how that's going to affect them. But if the Sharks want wants to go all the way, they're going to have to keep up doing what they're doing now. Yeah, that's going to be the challenge when they when they get home. But at least they've laid a great foundation on tour there. And let's yeah. uh, stay with you, Jacques, uh, to talk about the Lions game. The Lions playing against the Waratahs. The Waratahs did start favourites for this one, but there was plenty of guys who thought the Lions could win. And if I, I stand to be corrected, I think the Super Super Brew spread, which is generally weighted towards South African sides because most players are from South Africa, but there was a lot of people who, who fancied that the Lions could beat what had been a pretty ordinary Waratahs side. Uh, at the end mm. of the day, though, the Waratahs were too good for them uh, and, uh, and put the Lions really into all sorts of, all, all sorts of trouble because you know this was one of the games they would have expected perhaps to win on tour. Yeah, I must say, I also um, thought that if there was a game that the Lions could maybe do something, it was this game. And the Waratahs, yeah, I think they just came out the blocks racing. And um, the, the the Lions just never looked like they had any answers in that regard. Although, you know, um, there were they were a few... You could see the... It's, like, it's funny how tonight, the whole time we're referring back to the Bulls, you know, when we're comparing stuff and... Um, again, you know, it's just like you could see this, you know, when they're doing something, there's intent and they're trying, you know, they're trying. It's not just um, going through the motions um, and playing rugby and trying to get another 18 minutes past, you know, and just moving along and enjoying a tour. You know, these guys are actually committed and they, they're really trying. Um, and there were also one or two dubious calls in there that could have been handled better. Um, you know, one 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 that comes to mind is I think I think the yellow card um, on Swinton. I think it's Swinton. Um, I don't think that was a, a, a yellow card. It, it probably should have been a red. I mean, that was full on in the face um, of Elton Yankees. Um, Gardner was seeing things that the rest of us weren't seeing, and we were seeing things that he were that he didn't see. So, uh, and I mean, also the yellow card that the Lions got. I mean, they I think they. That there was a they, they scored points against the Lions in that time that they lost the yellow card. Also, that was a stupid yellow card, and also one that I initially I didn't think it was going to be a yellow card at best, a penalty. So it's just, yeah, the referees are becoming a big concern, and it's not just um, South African referees. It seems to be across the board, but there seems to have been. There must have been words in this last week since that article came out um, because there was not one game that I saw this weekend or that I, that I saw via Twitter where the ref didn't come into conversation. So, you know, there is something obviously going on and I think we saw it in the World Cup as well when as soon as, you know, World Rugby mm. got onto the yellow card bandwagon, we started seeing yellow cards flying all over the show. So... Clearly something's happening, but it's not happening, I think, in the right way. Or us fans, we don't know. There's two different rule books that we've got the one and they've got the other one and we seem to have the wrong one. Or they might have the wrong one. But 
Yeah, I feel sorry for the Lions, but at least they 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 showing that they wanna that they wanna play and that they are trying their best with the team that they've got. Right, just a reminder: you can catch us betting show Thursday nights, the handicap rugby chat at matters that's at nine o'clock. Andre, uh, what are your thoughts on the Lions? They're disappointing. Yeah, no, I I had them down to win, and but they they also they shipped three tries in seventeen minutes, so that's also coming out not not ready, not switched on. You know, that's the worst thing you can do on a rugby field is not come uh, is come onto the field and you're not ready to play. Um, I think if I I'm going to look at their back line, and I just don't think they're getting the selections right in the, in the entire back line. Uh, no issue. I understand uh, they will sort out the, the scrum of issues soon, but the 9-10 axis is working. That's fine. Alton's playing great rugby. He's making good decisions. Um, I think the, the problem comes in their midfield, and, and I think pro the, the, they're probably going to need another year together if they carry on selecting the players that they're selecting now before they can achieve what they've achieved in the past. Um, Simbalani, nobody, and I don't know why there's the cloak and dagger and why they're not being open, but why that chap has not started a game this yeah, year yet. That's a mystery. It is, it is a mystery. It is, it is actually, it's a bad mark on Lions Rugby Union not being open with regards to the player management uh, and their selection policy because there's... Uh, if you're going to have Alton Yankees playing the way he does, and you, you're not going to have players that compliment him on the outside, you're going, your backline's going to struggle to get going. Um, as well, the, the defensive line obviously hasn't been great. If you're going to give away 21 points, I think, sorry, it was seven, 17, 19 points in 17 minutes. Um, you know, so it's, there's something just not happy there. And, you know, in 2018, I put out and it still gets a couple of likes and mentions now and then. I said, uh, it's all great basing your game on attack, but it, it kind of blows up in your face the day your, you have a bad, your game has a... Let me try that again. It's all while you base your game on attack, but it'll blow up in your face the day you have an off day. And they had an off day on attack and, and defense because they structure their game around attack. And when you when you when defense is second in nature and you're going out to try and score more tries than other teams, that the day you, you you're knocking on and things you're not switched on, you're going to get punished. And they got punished this weekend. Um, so they've got a lot of work to do. Um, I don't, they, they're not going to be bottom of the log. Uh, they'll be mid table. They. If they, they fix a couple of things and get some good home wins and uh, tighten up the defense, they could squeeze into a, a playoff spot in the eighth position. But I don't I don't think they, they'll be pushing any higher than that. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there, Andre. Any closing thoughts then for the, on the show? Anything else catch your eye on the weekend uh, from a Super yes. Rugby perspective? Yes. Uh, the one big thing I noticed is this weekend specifically – all the South African side ship more than 20, 20 points. Now, no, Rossi, like, I tried to like, look at what, what, does, what does the Springbok coach want, uh, Jock Nino, but what is he going to want? What does the director of rugby want? And before last year's Super Rugby, Rossi was like, I don't want to concede more than 16 points. I don't want my sides conceding more than 16 points per game. This weekend, Lions 29. Sharks 23, Bulls 39, Stormers 33 points. Those are way above what Rossi has set as the, the threshold for conceding points. So, and I know the, the Sharks are, are perfecting the Springbok defensive pattern. Uh, the Bulls are nowhere with the defensive pattern. The Stormers this weekend actually got it wrong. They, they were disjointed. And the Lions, yeah, they just, uh, they, they're not... They don't really employ it uh, effectively at all. So I think uh, it'll be interesting to see the next two, three weeks how how many points we concede and tries we concede and if we sort out the, that defense. Because every single thing that these teams do should be with the aim of making the Springbok team better. And that's pretty much how I see it. 
Excellent. Thanks, Andre. It looks like um, it's now the turn of Jacques uh, Wi-Fi to play up there. So I'll do the closing of the show. If he pops back in the interim, we'll let him say goodbye as well. But thanks very much for watching. Uh, just a reminder that the show will be available on podcast uh, shortly after we finished here, and uh, it's available on all the major podcast platforms. Andre, just perhaps a final word from you. Have you looked ahead to this week's fixtures? Anything that really catches your eye? Um, Bulls, Highlanders, for example, any any games that you, you think are going to be good to watch? No, uh, I, I can be honest, I haven't. Uh, work obviously took a bit of priority today. Um, but yeah, I will definitely sit down and catch as much. Uh, I'm definitely probably going to be focusing on the Six Nations, that French-France-Scotland game. Mm. I think is going to be a, a cracker, so I'll definitely squeeze that one in. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. Jacques, closing thoughts from for you, from you uh, before we end the show? I don't have much to say. I just, um, before this weekend, I was quite optimistic about the, the Bulls Islanders game, seeing the way the Islanders are playing. But um, at this stage, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's best to maybe just keep it's quiet. Hard, and hard to be optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just take whatever comes your way and just, you know, if, it, if we win, we celebrate. If we lose, then it's like, like oh, well, what else? But um, other than that, yeah, I think like um, Andre just mentioned now, I think that Scotland France game we spoke about it last week already. It, it's going to be a going to be a hell of a game to play, and um, I, I don't know if there's any new word on on the is it Ireland Italy? Uh, if that game's still going on, I think it's yeah. is it still off? No, I think that at the moment now they said it's still on. Uh, okay, because I see uh, all sporting events yeah. around the world is starting to be cancelled, left, right, and centre, motor, GP, I see. So, yeah, I mean, the way they're cancelling and postponing races, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah, I think they'll I mean. make a call at the last minute before teams have to go. Yeah. yeah, it's just funny how Italy is suddenly the centre point of all of this corona stuff. But, yeah, um, Brent, to be honest with you, um, as a bull supporter, um, I, th I don't think one should get your hopes up too high and um, take whatever comes our way. And if we win, we win. Um, but, you know, um, one win doesn't change the whole season, although I think one win could ultimately just give the boys the confidence because I do believe we've got the right players. It's just a matter of finding each other and understanding that they can do the business. But at the moment... It's bleak. Yeah, no, I can hear you sound pretty bleak on that one. Just on that coronavirus, I saw a tweet, I think it was, that uh, there was a brothel, I think it was in Italy or somewhere there, or Spain, that was quarantined. And the thing said, imagine trying to explain that to your wife or boss while you're trapped in a, you're not allowed out the brothel. What, what the hell were you doing there in the first place? So I really enjoyed that one. I'm going to have another, have another yeah. look for that. I enjoyed it. But guys, thanks very much for joining us. Andre, well done on your degree. And uh, yeah, Cheers. we'll look for you on Twitter. And uh, Jacques, uh, I could, uh, hopefully you're feeling stronger all the time and uh, have a good week, man. Yeah. Thanks so much, Brent. Excellent, guys. Thanks very much. Couch Critic should be back next week. He's been a uh, loss. I saw pictures of him on Instagram. He was hugging a koala bear or, or something there in Australia. So he should be back next week as well. Look forward to having him back on. Guys, thanks very much. Thanks to the guys who did join us live. If you're watching a recording of the show, make sure you do go down and hit the subscribe button.